Alhamdulillah. The, um, the, the next section is about what are called the qawari' of the Qur'an, qawari' of shaitan. And these are the, you know, the qari'a in Arabic is, a, there's, a, there's a chapter called al-qari'a. Al-qari'a to mar-qari'a. And, and al-qari'a is something that strikes. And it's, it's the name of the Day of Judgment, Al-Qari'atu. And it's also a musibah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the qari'a that um, afflicts uh, the people of kufr. Uh, or it will uh, uh, be in their vicinity. And so the, qa the qawari' of the Qur'an, the, this is actually a technical term that uh, Imam al-Ghazali uses, and it was used before him. There's actually a book by one of the Central Asians called Qawari' al-Qur'an. So this was a term that was used to mean those verses of the Qur'an or surahs that are recited daily. And, and, and they're recited to taqra' shayateen, to actually withstand the assaults of the shayateen. So they, they protect a believer. So in essence, they're really they're verses of protection, and they're, re they're really important uh, verses. And one of the things about the, the Ummah historically is that they were, because so many people were doing these verses on a daily basis, there was a, a herd immunity for the, the, the whole Ummah. They, they had a herd immunity. But as they fall into ghafla, and less and less people do these on a regular basis, then the, the, the immunity of the ummah uh, lessens and diminishes until uh, you can be invaded, just like viruses come into you or bacteria if you don't have immunity. And so these are really to protect us as individuals. And one of the things that Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, the great Algerian Mujahid, he said in his muwaqif that the inaya of the ummah is being removed because of the sinfulness of the ummah. And he said, but the inaya will remain for individuals. So the way that we restore that inaya for the ummah is by a critical mass of believers that are actually uh, doing what we were told to be doing and staying within the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you have large numbers of, of Muslims transgressing the hudud, then they get, they get impacted by that, that transgression. So the Fatiha is one of the most, it is the single most important for this. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it at the center of his book. Uh, it literally is the entire Qur'an uh, in seven verses. So all of the Qur'an is in the Fatiha. And uh, Muslims traditionally recited it uh, for healing. Uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah says that he used the Fatiha and, and Zamzam to be healed of a serious illness that he had when he was in uh, Mecca. Uh, it's been used as a ruqya. Uh, which is um, a, a type of uh, where you actually recite over sick people. There's a famous story of, uh, of, of Imam Sahnun was known as al-Raqi, and that he, because traditionally they would uh, recite the Fatiha and then take some spittle and just um, put it on the sick person that they were uh, treating from the prophetic sunnah. And uh, one of his students, after Imam Sahnun passed away, he, uh, he would go and they would ask him to do the Fatiha and for over the sick person. With Sahnun, they used to get well immediately. And in fact, believe it or not, in, in, according to some of the fuqaha, it's permissible to take ajar on the ruqi, not to stipulate it, but to take ajar if the person gets uh, well immediately, not if, uh, if they don't. And so, they used to get well immediately, and afterwards his student would do the ruqya, and they wouldn't get well. And, and they would ask him, you know, when Sahnun did that, they would get well. He said, the Fatiha is the same. I think it's in the spittle. Yeah. In other words, you know, I'm, I'm not of his maqam, so I don't have that kind of power to operationalize the Fatiha 
in the way that he could do that. But the Fatiha is the Shafia. It's a healing surah. And we recite it every day. It has many asrar. Um, Sayyidina Ali said that he could uh, fill 70 camels with commentary. 70 camels with commentary. So the secrets of Fatiha do not end. Um, and there are many, many secrets in it. So it begins the book, and Al-Fatiha, which Al-Fatiha is the name of Allah, and Al-Fatah, the opener, and the one uh, hyperbole of Al-Fatiha is Fatah. Yeah, Fatah. And, and so the Fatiha is, they call it the opening. Technically, it's literally the, the, the one, it's a fa'il. It's, it's, it's the one that opens. So the Fatiha opens the Qur'an. And it begins, according to Imam Shafi'i and some of the Qurra, not all of them, Imam Nafi'i and Imam, uh, uh, which is the Qira'a of Imam Malik, the recension of Imam Malik, he begins it with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Amin. So this is a khilaf. Some of them, everybody's in agreement there are seven ayahs, what they're, because it's Sab al Mathani. What they're in disagreement about is that, is, is about the last ayah. Some split it into two. And then uh, about this, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Imam Malik did not consider the Bismillah from the Fatiha. And um, that's why he, in his madhab you don't read it in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the prayer. So, but it's, it's in the Fatiha, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, so this is Naba'un an that. This informs us about God's essence. When we say Bismillah, the Ba, there's a different debate about what type of Ba that is. Um, ba listi'ana, right? So there, there's some debates about the Ba. But the Bismillah is in the name of Allah or with the name of Allah or I s seek help with the name of Allah. So the Bismillah is... Uh, the opening, and then Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. These are the two attributes that Allah has chosen to define His essential nature. And they're both from Rahmah, and they're the attributes that Allah has chosen to define the essential nature of His Prophet, because His Prophet is a reflection of, of His attributes. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all those attributes, the Prophet, uh, it's called Takhalluq, Right, bi akhlaqillah. It's it's taking on these qualities that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reveals to His servant through His creation. So, and and the proof for this, there are many proofs, but one of the proofs is the Prophet ﷺ saw a woman once uh, suckling her baby, and he used it as a teaching. I mean, obviously, it was under the the hijab, so it wasn't he wasn't exposing her nakedness, but he 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 said to the uh, the, the, um, the companions, do you think this woman would throw her, um, her child into the fire? And there was also the woman who was running to find, and when she saw the baby, she grabbed it and clutched it, and she was a prisoner. And, and she was just so, and he, he looked and he said to his sahaba, do you think this woman would throw her child into the fire? And they said, no, she would never do that because the mother, the mercy of the mother. And he said, Allah is more merciful to his servants. So, so what he was showing was that that tajalli of his mercy, because every mercy in, in the, Allah has a hundred parts. All the mercy that exists in the world is one part of that hundred. So he saved 99 for his, the day of judgment. So all the mercy that exists in the world is for uh, the, uh, the one part of Allah's rahmah. The other 99, he's reserving for the Day of Judgment. And he said, if you see a, foal, a, 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 a mare, uh, make sure that she doesn't step on the foal. That's out of the rahmah. That's from that part of rahmah that Allah put into the world. So all the mercy in the world is from the mercy of Allah. Every mother that gets up at night when she hears her child cry, you know, every person that defend somebody, uh, every person that gives charity uh, to help uh, somebody, every physician that uh, goes the extra mile 
out of compassion for a sick person or a nurse that takes care or somebody who has an invalid husband and just spends years serving. <laughs> All those acts are from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why the Quran begins with Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And there's a lot of differences about that. But Rahman was a unique name. The, the Quraysh did not know it. This is one of the things about the Quran is that there's so much, there's so much newness in the Quran. And Rahman was one of those names. It's not permissible to name a person Rahman. You can call them Rahim, but not Rahman. Um, the Prophet's called Rahim in the Quran. It's an attribute. It's one of his names, Sayyiduna Rahim. Um, so, so the Rahman is the mercy in the, in the dunya. The Rahim is the mercy in the akhirah, according to some. Others say the Rahman is the mercy that envelops all of creation in his general love for all of creation. And I wrote about this in the prayer of the oppressed. The Rahim is the specific love that he shows to the people of taqwa, to the people that Allah loves, which is his mahabba khasa. The mahabba amma encompasses all of creation, his general love encompasses all of creation, but the mahabba khasa is specific to those that uh, draw near to him through their um, iman and through their a'mal, their actions, their faith and actions. And, and, and so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, he says, this informs us about God's attributes and fills people with hope and longing. So that, it's, it's encouragement to obey him. That's why he begins the book. He could have begun the book with other attributes, but he chose these attributes because he's calling us to him. And so that's how he begins his book. Uh, and, 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 the, and the first hadith, which I mentioned earlier, which is called the, uh, the uh, Musalsal Bil Awaliya, is Ar-Rahimun Yarhamuhum Ar-Rahman, Irhamu Man Fil Ard, Yarhamkum or Yarhamukum Man Fil Sama. Those who show mercy, mercy will be shown to them. Have mercy on everyone in the earth. Men, Sigat al umum. Have mercy on everyone. Even the one, the Mujahid, according to Imam Malik, is, he is, is Rahim because he's stopping people from their oppression. So to stop an oppressor, even if you have to fight them, it's actually out of an act of Rahmah. It's actually an, out of an act of mercy to do that. And so it's, it, this, this is, uh, you know, this is the, 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 the thing that will make us understand our Lord most is understanding the beginning of Al-Fatiha, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim or beginning of the Qur'an if it's not from the Fatiha. And then, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamd, there's Hamd al-Qadim lil-Qadim, the praise of the eternal for the eternal, the praise of the eternal for the hadith, for the created, the praise of the created for the eternal, and then the praise of the created for the created. So there's all these forms of hamd, and that's why the Prophet is called Muhammad. He is the one, but he's also Ahmad, which is the one who praises more than anyone else. Ahmadu, he's more, he, pr he does more praise than anyone else. So he's Muhammad. He's the most praiseworthy. So he's the one who praises more, and he's the one who's most praised. And his name is Muhammad. If that's not a, a miracle of our Prophet ﷺ, then I don't know what's a miracle of our Prophet ﷺ. Just the fact that his name is Muhammad, that that's his name. And everywhere around the world, he's praised. We're in California, and we're praising him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All this, everything that comes from this is through him and, and, and by means of him. Everything we have is from him, and through him, and by means of him. So wherever you are on the earth, there's people praising the Prophet. Nobody is praised. Mary is the second most praised person, probably, through the, through the Catholics. But the Prophet ﷺ, and Allah says that's another miracle, because that's clear in the Qur'an also, that he raised her... Uh, uh, to that place, that station that she has. So the Prophet them, that's his name, Muhammad. No matter what anybody says about him, it doesn't matter in that way. He said, they talk about Mudhammam, you know, the blameworthy. He said, I'm, that's not me. 
So whoever they're talking about, when they think they're talking about him to denigrate him, they're not denigrating, they can't even say his name. You know, they say other things like Muhammad or something. They're, it's not his name. They can't even say his name. Saraf Allah al sinatuhum anhu. You know, he, that's what he said. They, he, he removed their tongues from my name. So they can't even curse him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, Asul al-Hamd huwa shukr. The foundation of Hamd is, is, comes from gratitude. And I've said this before, but... You know, one of the ways that we praise people is through ovations, like clapping, you know, bravo, people, or standing ovations. Because what you're doing is, it's, it's like an expression of gratitude for the incredible performance that somebody has given, uh, a great orator or a, a great musician or something, uh, a politician or a civil servant or uh, somebody who has done something immense for humanity when they give them prizes. These people, they give them prizes like uh, Jonas Salk who gave, gave the world the polio vaccine um, and wouldn't patent it because he didn't believe that you should patent something that w would benefit humanity. Like we should do these things de gratis. Right? So, so that is you know, gratitude and, and, and so what we do five times a day is we give God a standing ovation. We stand up for him to give him a standing ovation for this. Just looking around and just seeing just how beautiful the world is and how ugly we as a species have made it. He made it beautiful. Even his terror is beautiful. A tsunami is beautiful. People will watch it on just to see it. Just a hurricane. People go to places where these things are happening to, to see them. There's tornado chasers. Because even his terror is, is amazing. It's, it's awesome. Everything that he does is awesome. And so that's what we do. We stand up. And that's what this is about. Alhamdulillah. These are the Hamidun. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu his Ummah are called the Hamidun. Because we say Alhamdulillah if, about everything. We say Alhamdulillah even when things are horrible. The Prophet taught us that. We say Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. I mean, that's from the Prophet ﷺ who taught us to be Hamidun. No matter what happens, we're Hamidun because it's all from God. And then he says, this is the beginning of the Sirat al-Mustaqim. Just to say, Alhamdulillah, to be from the people who praise, that's that you've entered into the path once you become a, somebody who praises his Lord, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. A shukr, ishara ila al afal. You know, this is gratitude. It's, 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 this is all an indication of these actions. Like, it's gratitude for everything. Lahu kullu shay. The Quran says, He has everything. And so we have gratitude for everything, in our praise for everything. Our Rahman and Rabbil Alameen is beautiful too because Rabbil Alameen, he's the Lord of the worlds. I mean, some say Alameen because it's called a, uh, a plural of the, the rational, Jama'u Aqal, right? Because Awalam is Ghair Aqal, it's the plural of the Ghair Aqal. So he could have said Rabbil Awalam, but he said Rabbil Alameen. So some, although he called cats Tawafun and Tawafat. So he used jam' al-aqal. And if you live with cats, you kind of suspect that maybe they do have some aqal um, because they're, they're very um, mysterious creatures. But he, he called them tawafun, the ones that just walk around your house because that's what they do all, all day long. They just walk around and, and uh, walk through your legs. And when you pray, sometimes they'll walk around you. So the... Uh, Rabbul Alameen are the Lord of the worlds. And Rabb is the one, Murabbi. It's, that's one of the meanings, is the nurturer. He's the one that takes 
the acorn. He's the creator of the acorn, but he's the one that takes the acorn and makes it a mighty oak. He's the one that took us from a drop that we can't, that you have to need a microscope to see it. He, from a drop of fluid, mostly water, right? Met in Mahin is mostly water. And then the ovum that you can't even see, you, you, you can, it's very, very small, right? But you, you can see it with a, a microscope. It's yellow, and the Prophet said it was yellow. He, he said that the woman's water was a yellow, opaque yellow, it was one of his miracles. And, and those two come together, and this explosion happens. This, this mitotic cell division from suddenly 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, it's just, and suddenly you've got billions of cells, and those cells are all working together. And, and from those cells, you get the liver, and the kidneys, and the brain, and the heart, and the eyes, and then the ears split at a certain point. And the Prophet said, Now we've seen through, through uh, the miracles of modern science, the splits that occur, they're literally shak, that occur in the ears and in the eyes. And so the Prophet used the exact word to describe what's happening. And all of that is happening, the miracle of life, just in those few moments, what happens is beyond belief. You're into millions of cells in, 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 in a very short period of time. A complete miracle. That, that is the murabbi. He, Rabbana, you know, khalaqtani, uh, you know, khalaqtani fil hasha janina, wa kunta li qabla waridayya. You created me in my mother's womb as a janine, as, as an embryo. And you were, me, you were mine. You were mine before you were my parents. You nurtured me. You gave me sustenance in the womb of my mother. I mean, we were in three veils of darkness. All of us, every single one of us that's alive on this planet or who has ever been alive on this planet went through this evolution that the Lord of the worlds was fashioning. He's al-khaliq al-bari al-musawwir. Yusawwirukum. Fi ayyi suratin ma sha'a rakkabak. In whatever surah, in whatever form he wanted to combine you. He used the word tarkiba, which is the word they use now in Arabic when they talk about the, the DNA, all the combinations of DNA. Millions of just the coding of one human being. It's, it's amazing. And that's why to kill a human being is like it's as if you killed all of humanity. To take one life out of the world, it's as if you've taken all of humanity. Because in essence, you have. So he is Lord of the world. And then, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, there's no repetition in the Quran. He's saying, don't think this is repetition. There's no repetition in the Quran. There's never any repetition. Because something that's replicated doesn't add any more fa'idah. So he again is, is reminding us, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Like that Rabbul Alameen is the Rahman, Ar Rahim. Like he did it with mercy intended. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa la yazanu al muhtarifuna illa man rahima rabbuk. Wa li dhalika khalaqahum. To show them mercy. Like he told us that you, they're all disagreeing, but he created them for li turhamu. And then Maliki Yomidin, there's two qira'a, there's actually more, there's Malik, and, but, but the two famous ones that people recite. In Hafs, which is on Asim, they say Maliki Yomidin. 
with a, with a, then you'll see a dagger alif in the, um, in, in the, in the rasam, in the mushaf. The original rasam Uthmani is Maliki, but that alif was, is added. So Maliki Yomi Deen, sovereign of the day of judgment. So the Malik is, every Malik is Malik, but not every Malik is Malik. And there, it's, the distinction is important because this is really beautiful in, 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 in Arabic. You need both because the Malik does not have, even though he's sovereign, a, ma a Malik, if he's not Malik, then the Mulk is not his. So the king, like uh, King Muhammad in, 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 in Morocco, King Muhammad in Morocco is, is he's the Malik, but he has no authority to go into the homes of the people and take their goods or anything like that. But if he's Malik, then he can. So Allah says he's Maliki Omidin and Maliki Omidin. He's both. He's the, the sovereign and he's the one who possesses all that is in his mulk, in his kingdom. And so he can do what he wants with it because the owner can do whatever he wants. If I took this phone and I threw it uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge, which from time to time I'm tempted to do, uh, if I did that, it's my property. I mean, it might be illegal to do it on the bridge. But if I destroyed it, it's my property. And you can't say, oh, you can't destroy that. I could say, no, I realize it's evil, so I'm getting rid of it. But it's my property. But if I took your phone and I destroyed it, saying this is evil, then I, I'm a vadim because I've taken something that's not mine. So Midiki Omidin and Maliki Omidin, they're both qira'a because both indicate a different aspect of his power over his dominion. So this is an ishara ila al-akhira fil ma'ad. So this is the eschatology, what comes after. He, and the yom is the last day. It's called yom al-akhir, the last day. And deen, deen is a, a really interesting word because it's, it's related to debt. So it's, it, it's in some ways it's the day the debts fall due. Everything has a reckoning in life. And so there's a day when the debts are going to fall due. The accounting is taken. It's called Yom al-Hisab, the day of accounting, the day of reckoning. This is when the tax man shows up and, and you have to show all your, and, and they do all that, and then they say, you haven't paid your taxes, right? That's an auditing. And then you get fined. In some cases, if you did it intentionally, like sinners, then you go to jail. So this is, this is the dunya. Everything in the dunya is to give us uh, analogies for the akhira. So there's a day of reckoning. You think you can just eat? There's no free lunch. You think you can just eat and drink and enjoy all this? Ayahsubun insan, an yusrakasuda. Does the human being reckon, or yahsabu in the qira? Does the human being reckon that he'll be just left without any accounting? Right? He, that, all this that went into creating you, all of this, thousands of years, all those people that survived wars and famines and, and plagues to bring you into existence in this time, in this day, and you think that your life is meaningless and that you can just simply do whatever you want and there's no accounting, it doesn't work like that doesn't work like that. So there's a day when the debts fall due. So that's in the Fatiha to remind us that day is coming. It's an indication of the life to come. And then, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ This again, the Quran, it's just amazing. First of all, if I said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, نَعْبُدُكَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ If we said, نَعْبُدُكَ وَنَسْتَعِينُكَ in Arabic, two things about that. One, the damir becomes muttasil, right? So, so when you say iyaka, it separates it. It's a transcendence. Like we know that God is... So even in the rasam, there's a, there's a, a spiritual indication. Iyaka, like you're, you're transcendent. You're, you're not... 
you're, you're, be, you're so beyond me. Iyaka. But then if I said, Na'buduka wa nasta'inuka in Arabic, that could mean Na'buduka and I also worship Lat and Uzza and others. Whereas when I say Iyaka Na'budu and I bring the, the, the mansub, the maf'un bihi, muqaddam forward it means you alone it's for hasar so iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in means only you i only worship you and i only seek help from you even and that doesn't mean you don't seek help from others but you do so knowing that that's a sabab that the help is from allah idha sta'anta fasta'in billah what the prophet told uh, his his uh, his um, uncles um, son, his cousin, he, he told him, Ibn Abbas, he said, you know, if you, if you seek help, seek help only from Allah, meaning that you recognize all the asbab. So highlight two important, this highlights two important pillars of faith. Sincere worship of God, the spirit of the straight path, and none other than God deserves worship, the essence of Tawheed. So now look at this. So there's the tahliya, is in the ibadah, and there's the tazkiyah, in the isti'ana. To, because you can't remove your negative qualities without Allah's help. And that's why the most successful addiction program in, in, in history here is the 12-step program, which was done by somebody who had a deep faith. And he begins by saying that you acknowledge a power greater than you. That's why it works, because they're acknowledging isti'ana. I can't do this on my own because the addict fails over and over because he's relying or she's relying on him or herself. When they rely on God, they can do it. But when you rely on yourself, you're left to yourself and you can't do it. <laughs> Don't leave me to myself one blink of an eye. So that, <laughs> so here's the straight path a question and a supplication that is the marrow, the mukh of ibadah. So the question and a supplication is the marrow of worship and it reminds us about the need of supplication which is the spirit of servitude. Just being in need that you're Abdullah, right? That, that, that we are antum al-fuqara. Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim wa la So the path of those that an'amta alayhim, that you blessed, غير المغضوبي, not the sirat غير المغضوبي, so that's, uh, that's uh, the mudaf to the sirat, um, mudaf ilayhi, mudaf ila, ila sirat. What الضالين, nor those who have gone astray. So, not those who have incurred anger. Who are those who have incurred anger? In some of the commentaries, they, they mention specific uh, groups, but the, Allah didn't mention specific groups in, in the Quran for a reason. Because this applies to anyone. The maghdub alayhim are people that know the truth and act in contradiction to the truth. Those are the maghdub alayhim. They know what they should do and they, they don't do it. That's how you incur the wrath of Allah. You know murder is wrong and yet you murder. You know theft is wrong and yet you steal. You know, uh, for a Muslim we know a lot of things. We know usury is haram. We know alcohol is haram. We know, so if you do those things, you're incurring the ghadab. The dhalin are the people who don't know. They're just astray. They don't have knowledge. They haven't been given knowledge. In the Quran, when Allah says, Alam yajidka dalan fahada, da there does not mean astray. And this is why the Arabic dal, and also when, 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 when the sons say to Yusuf, uh, to uh, Ya'qub, 
that he's in, in, in his dalal, in his previous dalal. It means his love. So, because when people fall in love, there's a kind of, um, you go a little bit astray when you're in love. And so it was used to mean somebody who's in love. Dal, he's in love. So the Prophet was seeking Allah out of love. And in that way, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's dal, but he's not astray. He was never astray, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he found you looking for him in love. So he guided you. So, so, um, and then تذكير بنعمتي على أولياءه That he has blessed his, the awliya, these are his allies. You know, the awliya, these are the, the ansar, the people that support God in the world. God needs no support, but he has told us to be ansar. In tansurullah yansurkum. Like, if you help God, God will help you. That's why they said, some of them, one of them, but, you know, one of these um, clever deviants said, you know, oh, is God is poor, you know. Like, he's asking for our money. So what, he's poor? Right? So, no. You're the poor one. He's testing you. It's a test to see you claim that you love God. You claim that you believe in Allah. You claim that you... A sadaqatu burhan, the hadith says. Charity is a proof. It's a demonstrative proof of faith. So if you're not giving it, then where's your faith? Allah doesn't need it. So, غضبوا على عدائه لتستثير الرغبة ورهبة من صميم الفؤاد. So this also is to give us رغبة and رهبة. رغبة is this kind of hope, desire, and رهبة is fear. It's 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 like a deterrent. De terere, from the Latin, out of fear. That's what a deterrent is. That's why in the Quran, they translate لِتُرْهِبُوا عَدُوَ اللَّهُ وَعَدُوكُمْ To strike terror in the hearts of your enemy, the enemies of God and your enemies. That's, that's not the right translation. It's to deter. You deter. And, and terror is in deter. Because it's... They don't want to fight you because they see how powerful you are. That's why أَعِدُّوا لَهُمَّ اسْتَطَعْتُ مِنْ قُوَّةً Be strong so that they are deterred from attacking you. So when we become weak, then they come and they take over your lands. That's why people say, oh, this national defense, it's crazy. Countries that, that that's what they do because there's people out there that are going to take over your country. This is the dunya. If they're stronger than you, they'll come. If they, oh, that's good land. Oh, they've got lots of minerals there. Oh, there's, uh, there's uranium. We need uranium. You know, look, at they're, they're just, they don't have any national defense. Nowadays, they do it very, you know, they come saying that they're, they're coming to do this, that, or the other. They, because we have this international... You know, all these, you know, the Enlightenment brought all these ideas like human rights and uh, we should like. So they, now it's just they do it through deception. But it's the same thing. It hasn't changed. It's just different. You know, we're bombing you because we care about you. That, that's, all, that's all it is. There's still, it's still the same thing. People suffer. People die. But when you're strong, right, Teddy Roosevelt, walk tall and carry a big stick. That was, his, that was what he said his foreign policy was. You know, just so nobody messes with you. So traditionally, the Muslims, that's the way they were. Everybody's in awe of them. They didn't want to attack them. But when they used to go in Andalusia, they say that the, 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 the Christians used to send spies down and, and they'd ask what they were doing. He said, oh, they're all studying. They're, they're, they get up at night. They're, they, they, ha they do a lot of furusia. You know, they're doing a lot of military. They're, And they said, mm, not time yet. Sent later, come back. Mm, still same situation, not time yet. 
it's a comeback. Oh, we, now they're partying a lot. They, they have a lot of, they're drinking wine. They're, they're listening to, there are a lot of poetry recitations, um, a lot of, right? And, and they said, it's time. That's what happened. That's why you have to, you know, now you have all these people here in this country um, who actually, they're just useful idiots. They don't even know it because there's, there's countries that really want to see this country go down. There are a lot of people who want to see this country go down. And, but there, there, there are also, you know, there is an idea of be careful what you wish for because there's other countries out there that have a very different, I mean, at least you find out about Abu Ghuraib. At least you find out about Guantanamo. There's countries where you don't find out about any of these things. And if you try to, they kill you. It's as simple as that. So Allah knows best. We just ask for whatever Allah, whatever's good for us, we ask it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for you to think that you can decide what's good for you, it's called istikhara for a reason. You're asking Allah to choose. If it's good, you know, make it happen. And if it's not, don't make it happen. So we don't know. But there's a lot of people that, that are supporting, they're, they're really what Lenin called useful idiots. You know, they, they think that they're doing good, but they're actually doing the enemy's work for them. And uh, one of the things that Thomas Sowell said about the communists, he said he read a book called um, When China uh, Shook the World. There's a couple different books that have that title, but the one he read was written about the takeover of the communists uh, in China. And he said, he read it when he was a young man. I mean, he's 90 now or 91. He said he read it when he was a young man. And he said that the book made the argument that it was through the educational system that, that they succeeded by getting the children and indoctrinating them. And then when they were ready, they had all their minions. He said he found it hard to believe that. But he said, now watching American academia for the last 40, 50 years, he said it actually makes perfect sense that that's how they do it. You, you destroy the institution, trust in the institutions. You teach them all these ideas uh, to, to hate authority, to hate, even though when it breaks down, it's quite horrible for people, and in particular for women. When things break down, the Tigray women right now, they're begging for real men because they're being raped horribly. I mean, what's happening in Ethiopia is so beyond belief. It's just beyond belief. It's ha you know, you see these things and it's just like it's, what, where, where are the human beings? It just really makes you wonder. Like, where are the human beings? These poor women. So the opening contains all of these meanings. All these things that he... Imam al-Ghazali, right? He gave us 10. Do you remember? It has eight. There's only two that aren't in the Fatiha. So it has dhikr or that, the divine essence. It has the divine attributes. It has the divine works. It has the life to come. It has the straight path. And it has both tazkiyah and tahliya. Na'budu, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. And then it has dhikr ahwal al-awliya. An'amta alayhim. Dhikr ahwal al-a'da. It has all eight. The only two it doesn't have are dhikr muhajat al-kufar and dhikr hudud al-ahkam, which he says the reason for that is because these are the least important aspects of his message. And so he did not put them in. One is arguing with the kufar, which is ilm al-kalam, and the other is the details of the sharia because of the danger of becoming uh, these legalistic people that lose the spirit. So he left those two out for that reason. It's not they're not important, but they're not at the center of, of this teaching. So, and then the Prophet ﷺ said every section, uh, the, 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 the Fatiha opens all eight gates of Jannah. So each one of these opens a gate of paradise. 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, if you use that as the beginning. The other one is Sirat al an'amta alayhim, and then the second uh, ayah is Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa So the, the, that's the warsh, Imam Warsh al-Nafi'. Warsh al-Nafi'. So those are, those are the, the eight. So alhamdulillah, we'll stop there, inshallah. Um, anyway, difficult times, so my apologies for, uh, it's a little difficult to get through some of this stuff today. Uh, but, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah make it easy for our brothers and sisters, wherever they are. There's a lot of suffering out there and we're, and we're blessed, um, you know, just to be in, in uh, safety and security. And may, may Allah maintain it, you know, our safety and security. And may He give us uh, the ability to help others that aren't in these kind of conditions, help them get out of their conditions, inshallah, at least with prayer. So, does Ana mean different universes? I mean, obviously there are different, um, there are different dominions. You know, universe, we use universe to say everything that is in the world that we're in. So this is the mulk. There's the malakut, the jabarut. I mean, there's, and then the malakut in relation to the mulk is like a huge desert in relation to a small ring in the middle of it. So... It's what's beyond this is so much vaster than this. And this now we know how vast it is. I swear by the positions of the stars. And this is a vast oath if you but knew. Now we know. Uh, I mean, we, don't, we have, put it this way, we know more about the vastness of, of the positions of the stars because of... Uh, Telescopes and things like that. It's still we don't know. We don't know how vast this thing is, but it's huge Why are certain stories in the Quran repeated multiple times one of the things when you spiritually were children and One of the things that children demand is that you tell them the same story over and over again Because it's the way that they learn So they want to hear it again and you know, I used to read to my boys and I would get really bored with the story, so I would like switch it up and try to like tell it differently than it was in the book. They would get so upset. That's not the way it is. Please read it the way it is. So I would, I would realize that, okay, something else is going on here. So, and, and then also, there's no replication. They're not repeated. Like Imam al-Ghazali said, every story, when you see it again, is told in a different way. I'll give you one example. In one na uh, narration, it says that Moses threw down his staff and it was a thu'ban. In another, it said it was a, uh, a, 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 a jinn, jin, you know, it was jinn, like it was a... So in one, it was a hayatun tasa'a. It was a hayatun tasa'a. So in one, it's a thu'ban. In the other, it's hayatun tasa'a. Well, the difference between thu'ban Thu'ban is like a python. Hayya is a small snake. So there's a difference of opinion about it, but the one I prefer is that it was a thu'ban in its size, but, but large snakes are very slow, whereas a hayya is very fast. So it was s s big in its size, but fast in its speed. The others say when he first threw it down, it was a hayya, because he made it something uh, that wouldn't cause him a lot of fear. But then when he threw it down in front of Moses, it was... So there's different opinion about that. But the point is, th there's a, a nuance in it. And there are many examples of that in, in the Quran, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the stories. What is your opinion on sharing personal reflections on Quranic verses? Sometimes I feel that I understand a deep meaning behind verses, but I'm cautious. I mean, you should be cautious. I would agree with that. Um, we can reflect on the Quran, definitely, and, but never say this is what it means. You know, because only Allah knows, and the scholars, we know what the Arabic words mean, but to take isharat out of them, Imam al-Ghazali in this book goes into detail about that, but you really have to have re requisite knowledges. Sahaba were very loath to speak about the Quran. Uh, in fact, they asked 
Omar radiallahu about, um, they asked him about um, Ab in the Quran. You know, the, when, when in, in, uh, in the uh, Abbas wa Tawalla, it talks about the foods, you know, and the last one is Abba. And so he was asked about Ab. And he said, Ayu sama'un tu dhilluni wa ayu ardin tu qirruni idha takallamtu fi kitabi la bi ghayri ilm. Like what heaven would cover me and what earth would hold me up if I spoke about the Quran from my own opinion. Like he didn't know what it meant, so he just left it. So um, it's, you have to be very careful and, and you really need to learn Arabic and just be careful. Even Arabs who read the Quran, they think they understand it because they know modern Arabic. But when they go into the tafsir, they'll find that it's quite different from what they thought it was. There are many examples of that. And then I have a question about Al-Fatiha. Allah created everything purely from His mercy, and this is a gift. If Allah asks us to worship Him in return, how is His creation then a gift? I, I, I get what you're asking. Well, the thing is, when, when somebody gives you a gift, you feel gratitude. So the thing is, he's not demanding, right? He's, and if you're an ingrate, then, you know, you suffer the consequences of an ingrate. But it is a gift from Allah. So I think what you're saying is, it's a gift with strings attached. Uh, I think that's, that's the idea. So life is a gift, but it's a gift that does have demands on us. It, it comes with a responsibility. And it's we, for whatever reasons, we accepted it. That's what the Quran says, that we accepted this amana, this sacred trust. So the, the word is amana, which is a trust. You know, so we use gift more as a, you know, this is a, it's, it's a, the Quranic term is amana, you know, that we, you were given a trust. So a trust you're responsible for, but, but it's still, we feel the gift of creation, the gift of life and all these things, and, and we feel gratitude for that. But it's, this is a trust. We're stewards. We've been put in a trust. So in that way, it's not a gift, it's a trust. And, and, and that's, that's what I think, that's how I would answer that. Uh, how do we attain peace of heart at times like this? Well, you have to, you know, we have to, we cannot allow the world to rip us apart. If you despair, if you get depressed, you're just another victim of Iblis. And we can't, the Prophet said, you know, when, 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 uh, when Fatima, it was one of the most powerful hadiths, when Fatima saw him, because he had Sakarat al maut and she saw him, and she just said, uh, you know, wa abata, wa karabata, you know, oh, how terrible this is. He said, no, 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 don't say that. He said, it's all peace after this. And that's why we have to remember, we're not people of dunya. The dunya is what it is. It's always been like this. It's always had these elements in it. And if it, the, the problem now is television and the fact that you see it from everywhere. So, and it's perfectly acceptable for you to just, you know, I would really caution about watching this stuff and because it will rip your heart apart. It's, you know, certain people have to know things and the rulers are responsible for this in the end. I mean, they have the biggest and that's why I don't pity them. Uh, you know, I pity them rather uh, because it's the rulers that have the biggest responsibility in these type of things. Those of us who don't have power, uh, we can condemn things. Those of us who are um, attributed to scholarship or learning or something like that, we, we should speak out and condemn what we can and encourage others. We should encourage our Jewish brethren and our Christian brethren, especially now because these are violations against holy spots. I mean, on Layla al-Qadr, you know, on, I mean, on, that's like 
attacking the Vatican on Christmas, you know, for the Christians or, 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 or the, you know, Church of the Sepulcher, you know. Um, so, so, you know, we, we would expect from them and, and, and the tzaddik in the Jewish tradition, he stands by righteousness irrespective of who it is. So the Jewish rabbis, they, they know what, I mean, they're commanded to justice. They have the same teachings as we have about justice. They can't side with their tribe when things are just wrong. They have to side with the truth. And then we have to side with them when our tribe is wrong. I mean, that's the way it works. We can't play it uh, both ways. We, we have to, when, when our side does things that are unjust, we have to be the first to condemn it. When, when, when people who, who claim to be Muslims attack churches, we have to condemn that, or synagogues. But this is the, for the Jews, it's, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a sacred spot also. They're not even allowed by Orthodox Judaism to go onto the Temple Mount. It's illegal in their religion. And they know this. It's illegal by halakha law. And I'm not making that up. They're not allowed to go onto the Temple Mount because they can only go there when the Messiah comes, according to their own tradition. So actually those soldiers are going against Jewish law and desecrating their own religion. So it's a double crime in that way. It's a crime against our faith and it's a crime against their faith. So, you know, but like I said, this is the world. And, and the Prophet ﷺ suffered greatly, but it doesn't stop you from moving. And he was always hopeful, despite it all. I mean, he was, he was treated terribly, but he encouraged us. We're people of faith, we're people of hope, and also we're people that know that suffering is redemptive, that a lot of the sins of our ummah are being removed through this, because we, we're sinful. I mean, there, I mean, if you look at the Muslim ummah, and, and the types of things that are going on in the Muslim world right now, we, we have to take some responsibility. But there's also things that are destiny that are outside of our control. There are things that have to happen, um, and th these are in the knowledge of God, and we, we have to leave it to God. But we, you know, all of us have our own individual areas, and, and we have to do that. So don't, you know, it's almost like it's self-indulgent to be depressed. You know, like, they're smiling as they're being carried off to, uh, you know, to Israeli prisons. I mean, if anybody, they're the people that have a right to be depressed about things, but they're standing firm and they're, uh, and, 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 and I think we should support them in that, in that way, whatever, in whatever ways we can, you know, so. What can regular Muslims do in these times of oppression? I mean, again, I think, you know, you can't worry about other people, or the silence of other people. That's their own business. You know, you can, if you want to condemn everybody, you can condemn everybody. We condemn what's unjust, but people, people are in different situations and, and they know their situations and, we know our situation. We're fortunate to be in a country right now, as far as we can tell, still, we can, we can s speak up. But we have also a culture that's becoming incredibly totalitarian, just canceling people and uh, anything that goes against whatever the zeitgeist or whatever people think is, is the way we should be. So, but, you know, we can still speak, and, and so we should uh, use that to the best of our ability, but we should also use it with wisdom and not alienate people and just, we, we need allies. We need allies. Are there signs of someone being a wali? What was Imam al-Ghazali's view? I mean, the greatest sign of wilaya, first of all, you should really consider Every, Muslim, every human being a potential wali. Because Omar was a wali in the knowledge of God when he was worshiping idols in Mecca. So you just don't know. The, the Moroccans say, you know, that, that, you, that every person you should think of is a potential wali. Because you just don't know. 
But wilaya amma, every Muslim has that. Allah wili ladina amanu. So wilaya amma is for every Muslim. Every Muslim you should consider a wali, even if they deviate. Because the, you know, they're dhanimun li nafsi. Thumma awrathna al-kitab al-ladhina stafayna min ibadina. Faminhum dhanimun li nafsi. Bada'a bihim, Allah began with them to give them hope. So even deviant Muslims that still believe in Islam and say they're Muslim, we should consider them having a, a portion of wilaya. Um, but the wali that I think there you're asking about is a sanctified soul. Those are very rare. Um, and and uh, the biggest sign is istiqama. When you see real uprightness in their character, they don't backbite, they don't uh, do, you know, th those people are quite rare. They're, and, and we should consider them uh, people, but nobody knows who the awliya are. They, the, 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 the Moroccans say Allah hid three in three. He hid his awliya in his creation. So you don't know who they are. And he hid Laylatul Qadr in his month of Ramadan. And he hid his uh, acceptance in, his, in, in, in your actions. Like you don't know what action is going to be accepted to him. So it could be like the, the prostitute that gave the dog water from her shoe. Allah forgave her. Even though she was a prostitute. It says baghi. I mean, it's in the hadith. She was like a fallen woman. And, and yet that act, Allah forgave her for it. So we don't know. So, I mean, that's a saying, but it's a nice saying. Um, did our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read uh, the... Sh he, the Prophet was commanded to believe in himself. So he taught us the... Uh, so he's, he's a believer and he has to follow his deen. He follows it more than anybody. So the Prophet Sallallahu we pray on ourselves in the prayer, right? Wa ala ibadillahi, right? I mean, yeah, we, so we're hoping to be from them, inshallah. I mean, we don't know, but, and then we also give salam when we enter our house. Right? As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin. Right? When you come into your home, you, this, to, so the Prophet Sallallahu it's not surprising that he would uh, do that. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Zakumullah khairan. Like I said, may, 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 may we utilize these last few days um, of, of the month that we have. And it looks like we're going to have 30 days, which is good. There's some people that are like, ah, oh. but I, I think, you know, we should be happy one more day of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar.